Hi guys and welcome back, I am RedZ and today we are going through all of the gameplay changes to RTR Imperium Surrectum version 0.6. Point 4, so you're prepared for the update that is coming most likely on Sunday, which when this video comes out, will be tomorrow guys. So don't be afeard, you don't need to comment down below when the update is coming out, because that is your answer guys, tomorrow, ready to go. So, so far guys, we've been over the Illyrians, the map, the units, and the new emergent factions, all that sort of thing, in very, very much detail. So we're not going to go over that again today. I'm more here to show you some of the gameplay tips and tricks that you are going to have to do when it comes to 0.6.4. In terms of these changes, guys, please remember that they are in relation to all of the remastered areas. So we're talking Greece, Illyria, and Anatolia, and Thrace. So these changes, of course, are not going to be in effect for the areas that are unremastered. So make sure you are playing in these regions when you get onto this patch. So let's talk about one of the most important aspects of any mod, and that is recruitment, guys. Now, it's going to be slightly different from what you've seen before. These recruitment centers that you see down here, Antigone Recruitment 5, they are just going to be player only from now. The AI doesn't have to use these, even if you do see them potentially in AI settlements. They don't actually give the AI anything. They are just there as a stopgap for the next update when recruitment is pretty much going to be reformed and reforged completely. So for now, the AI just has them just in case they go that route in the future, but you don't need to worry about that because you need this building still to recruit. And now, as you can see, there are five full levels to this building. There are no longer just four going up to large city. It goes all the way up to huge city. Level one gives you your basic AOR, as you can see here. Level two gives you some better AOR troops or a more expansive AOR roster. Level 3 gives you your full AOR like it did previously, so all the AOR units available in that region. Level 4 then completely moves on to giving you your full factional units. So if you are in a forward base, you need to get up to large city to get your full factional units for this patch. And then level 5 gives you your full factional units plus generals, recruitment and siege weapons as well. Not that many people actually use siege weapons in this game, but uh, you can do if you want to. But you can also recruit your general too from level 5. Now, I know this system is going to get completely overhauled in the next few updates, but I think that being at level 4, getting your factional units, is a good simulation of the fact that usually when you take a region, you're not going to be able to recruit troops of your culture and your military style straight away. You're going to have to build up that region and also, you know, bring, that, bring your culture to the region as well. So I think it's a good simulation of that for the time being until it's completely overhauled. Now, these recruitment centers cannot be destroyed now. That is to stop you from doing what I was doing. So another reason to slow me down, <laughs> another thing to slow me down is, uh, you know, blitzing settlements and just destroying this building um, that was in the hands of the AI, getting loads of cash from it, giving you a big boost. So that has been there to stop you from blitzing as much or being able to continue the blitz and just blitzing cities just for the cash. Of course, you can still destroy the barracks and all that sort of thing still if you want some extra money or any other buildings too. So it's not a huge loss to you. But in terms of building your own, it's going to take you less time to build these now as well. That's going to help you in the long run get more units quickly. Also now, logically, because the AI doesn't have to build this recruitment building, they get a slight recruitment advantage over you to make them a little bit harder. So extreme mode should be even more difficult if you want to play on extreme mode. But to compensate for this, there is now the homeland system, which we are going to go into later. But every single faction now has at least one homeland with a level 4 or 5 recruitment center to show how important it is. For example, Athens here has Athenian recruitment 5, but of course it's only a minor city. So you still will get access to a lot of your good units if you upgrade the barracks and all that sort of thing in this settlement to allow you to recruit some very good units from early in the game. 
But links with that, now the fact that the AI doesn't have these recruitment buildings will also mean that you can no longer just cripple these small factions just by taking their capital. They'll still be able to recruit okay units from some of the other settlements that they have and you can't just take their capital and then they are completely destroyed giving the ai a little bit more bite as well as you can see though in some of your outer regions as we are here with athens you will have lower level recruitment centers and potentially not too many barracks to recruit from these areas as well so you get one very powerful recruitment hub as these smaller uh, factions but you're not going to have as much power outside of your homeland region with the recruitment some factions like the seleucids and the ptolemies for example are going to have multiple big recruitment centers because they deserve it and of course it's historically accurate and now along with relegating aor to just the first three recruitment levels the aor has been significantly cleaned up and balanced no more getting rhodian slingers at level one aor in roads as you can see they are now level three for the aor so there has been a lot of cleaning up of these aor regions so as you can see we're at adrissa captured by the athenians and you can see now that the aor is no longer a bit of a mix of all these different cultures it has really been cleaned up so that it's more intuitive and more accurate per region so that it's a lot simpler for you to get your head around and know which aor units are going to come from which region this moves us nicely onto the religion mechanic which of course is to represent the cultures of the things when we talk about this mod guys we have building cultures which here as athens is greek and then we have religions, which is to represent the actual cultures of the places. And as you can see, guys, there is no longer the polis buildings in there. That is going to be um, worked on and brainstormed um, for the future. I have already said this in a previous video, but the mod team have tried so many things with culture. And it's a very, very hard thing to balance with religion should i say it's a very very hard thing to balance they've tried so many different multiple uh, setups for it and none of them have been quite right so they've removed those culture policies from there for now and predominantly your religious conversion is going to come from your recruitment building as well but with the uh, the governor's palace it has also been put in in the background as a hidden resource basically just to free up building slots for the future to add more buildings into that so each region in here has a hidden resource that will uh, convert these places to the religion of the place historically and to counter that you then need to convert the region with your recruitment building that is the one uh, thing that you have control over to convert the region uh, to your culture using the recruitment building overall though the religion feature in this patch is really not that much it is there aesthetically now you may get spikes of unrest every now and then from the religion but if you just get some um, unrest air like randomly out of the blue guys then just ignore it keep them happy for a turn or two and it should return to normal but they have added in a new feature that religions don't cause unrest if they are in the same family of religions so for example ionian probably in the same family as aeolian so if this settlement is taken by an aeolian person like the bosporans then they are not going to get religious unrest in here even though it is ionian it's going to allow you to expand into regions of similar cultures a little bit faster than you maybe could do before so that is really cool to see like i say this is going to be worked on heavily in the next few patches they're really going to try and brainstorm some ideas and come up with a more intuitive and fluid system and as i said previously this is really not something you need to worry about too much in this patch it's pretty much something that you can gloss over until they flesh out a full system for the next patches now this leads nicely on to a brand new feature for this patch guys the homeland system now homelands for factions are the historical homelands of each faction the historical important cities in their nations factions like the seleucids for example will have a few homelands dotted around the map whether in anatolia whether in mesopotamia or in the east 
Two, other smaller factions like Pergamon, for example, may only have one or two homelands. Some of these smaller factions in Greece may only have one or two, like Sparta, for example. Now, a homeland is a region that your faction holds very, very dear. Indeed, one of the main areas for this faction in history, one of their main settlements and regions. Now, what this means for the gameplay is the fact that if one of the homelands revolts against someone who has come and taken it, it will go back to the original faction as long as the original faction is still alive. Now, we went through this a lot in the cultural generics video, so for a bigger breakdown, go and check that out. Now that's going to lead to some really interesting gameplay because if you blitz too much and don't focus on public order, then you're going to have situations where you may have settlements revolting back to their original owners. For example, we have taken Sparta as the Seleucids here. We're going to crank it up to very high. We're going to end the turn and let's watch it revolt back to Sparta. And as you can see, guys, Sparta has revolted against us and it has gone back to Sparta. But this also represents another part of that and that is the fact that as we can see Ephesus here has revolted from us and it has gone to the cultural generic. So if there is a region that is not a homeland for a faction it's going to revolt to a cultural generic. If it is a homeland it will revolt back to the people whose homeland it was. And then if it revolts from a cultural generic it will then revolt to the rebels. So there's going to be a lot more dynamic factional gameplay rather than just seeing rebels revolting out from you all the time. So now, for example, I'd have to make the decision. Do I risk fighting the Greek city-states and, and having war with them now rather than, of course, just leaving it and trying to consolidate some of my other land? So those are, those are the decisions you're going to have to make. Uh, going forward when you do get revolts my advice try and avoid them <laughs> it's always a good thing to do guys avoid your cities revolting but of course with the Seleucids and Ptolemies and some of these bigger regions gonna be a lot harder especially if you try and blitz regions as well overall though I think this is gonna bring a lot to the game for example imagine being the Antigonids at the start of the game you start at war with Ephorus and you blitz down this region you destroy their only army and you just blitz the rest of Ephorus now if you don't secure these lands and keep them happy they are just going to revolt back to Ephorus as long as it survives so it really does represent a lot more historically accurate and immersive gameplay because that is of course what would happen in real life too so i think this is going to be a fantastic feature for all of you guys as well do remember that the homeland system is currently a work in progress and at the minute you can't really tell too much what is homeland and what isn't but in future they're going to add some mechanism for you to be able to tell which lands are your homeland and which aren't now this moves us on to another brand new fantastic feature and it's called the empire system we can see it in this message here and this is another work in progress feature that they are testing for future releases but i think this is going to be really really good for some of you that struggle with these small starts so the empire system is in there to balance out the small and large starts guys so it will give and take away money based on the size of your empire as you can see we are starting as sparta here we have three settlements and that's all so we have significantly more money coming in well we're losing money but we've got significantly more income than we did previously as sparta in 0.6.3 and that is because we are only empire size two two to five cities therefore we're getting a boost to our economy in some of these cities as you get larger and larger that boost gets up to neutral and then when you get to very large as well that will become a reduction as well to balance out your economy and try and stop snowballing as things happen because we all know with total war guys once you've got to a certain size you can just roll over anybody it's <laughs> it's really not a challenge after a certain point and this is really there to try and combat that. 
Of course, like I say, it's a work in progress, but this is going to allow some of these smaller starts like Sparta, Athens, the Achaeans, Aetolian League, all those sort of tiny little factions, a little bit of a boost early game and help them out until they've taken a few more settlements. Along with this though, guys, there has been a raft of changes to the starting positions of nations. Remember guys, when I'm talking about these changes, I'm just talking about those remastered areas, not the areas that are yet to be done. But each remastered faction has been balanced so that their start is changed based on how difficult people have perceived them to be and whether they needed a boost or a bit of a cutback as well. As you can see, some of these factions start with a different amount of troops to what they did previously and that has all been balanced as well but always remember that not all factions are born equally guys and some of these changes although historical as well based on historical accuracy you know not every faction is going to be easy some are going to be very difficult like athens is still going to be very difficult as well so a lot of factions they are not born equally guys and that is right. You know, you don't want all factions to be equally easy or difficult at the start of the mod. You want some to be a lot harder and some to be a lot easier as well. And one other massive historical thing that has gone on is that the relations of all of these remastered factions and their diplomacy has been completely overhauled based on the historical data of their alliances and enemies at 270 BC, which is when, of course, the mod starts. So, for example, you can see here that the Spartans have a host of allies at the start of the game, unlike they did before. And here, with the Antigonids, we can see that they are allied to the Seleucids. They've got Kabyle and Knossos and Messene as allies too, but they are at war with the Galatians and Epirus. So all of this historical data has been collated and given all of these factions their true historical start at 270 BC, which I think is just awesome. And on top of that, guys, AI behavior has also been modified to fit factions' historical rivalries. Very similar, in my opinion, to sort of the rivalry system in Europa Universalis. So certain factions will have a hatred and a rivalry of other factions. Think Athens versus Sparta. Think Epirus versus Macedon. The Seleucids versus the Ptolemies. So the AI now will make a lot more logical decisions in terms of the enemies that they pick. It's unlikely now, guys, that you're going to see Seleucids and Ptolemies not fighting each other ever. <laughs> like, hopefully they should actually fight each other now. So this has made a big difference to the AI and improved them quite a bit so that they will make proper decisions based on who they are going to fight and who they don't like in the remastered world. This, of course, is not just going to be a pure historical thing, and they're going to adjust this based on feedback from the gameplay and seeing which factions tend to attack other which factions and whether that's right or not. So, of course, this is going to be adjusted as time goes on, as with all of these changes, my friends. And some changes in relation to some of the larger empires and smaller places as well, to be fair. But villages now are back in the game, guys. As we can see, we've got one here. And we've also got one over here for the Seleucids too. So there are villages back in the game. Now, there aren't too many of them, but they are to represent, you know, places that were obviously very small at the time or would be founded maybe later than the 270 BC date on the mod. So they are back in the mod, although don't worry, there's not many of them. And on top of that, guys, for a lot of these factions, there are now named characters in nearly every single settlement in remastered areas. So when we're talking the Seleucids, we're talking Anatolia and West. Um, and then, of course, the Antigonids, Epirus, all of these remastered areas in Greece and Anatolia now should have pretty much a named character in each of these regions as the garrison. This will allow you, of course, plenty of opportunity to pick the best general 
available and pick the areas where you think you can bring the best governors, swap governors around and get good governors in these regions too. So that is going to be fantastic because who doesn't love a few extra characters? Moving smoothly onto characters then guys, there has been a ton of new traits and ancillaries specifically added for the Thracian Anatolian and Illyrian cultures as well. So not everyone is anymore going to look Greek. So you can see this guy is clearly a Thracian heroic savior, which is really cool to see. I will be doing a full interview on this with Lusitanio. So check that out tomorrow when you get chance as well. Now all of these guys also have specific homelands where they originated from and their heritage in terms of their religion slash culture as well. And now there is a lot more personality traits to give these guys a little bit more character and also show uh, differences between characters as well. So not every character is going to end up being a 10-10-10. They're going to be very different dependent on on their character. There is just a ton more personality traits and just traits in here in general. As you can see, this guy likes strangers, which really reduces his public security, but he's bored by dramas too, which people don't like. He's an inveterate gambler as well. He loves a bit of a gamble. He's plain. He's a poor farmer, open-handed. You know, there's a lot of extra traits in here. Uh, as well, which is really, really good. Now, if you're not someone who wants to roleplay too much, you can just go onto this stat screen here and just have a look what bonuses and negatives this guy has. As you can see, minus 20 trade. So we probably don't want to put him in a trade area. Minus one morale, probably not good for a general, but plus 10 taxes. So might be worth moving this guy to a region with more taxes and less trade, for example. So overall, this is going to allow you a lot more opportunities to role play and also pick and choose your characters based on the regions and based on the strengths and weaknesses of them and choose where you want to put them, whether you want them to lead an army, whether you want them to govern X city. It's really, really going to help out. And of course, there are a lot more triggers for getting these traits now too. And especially one very special mention must go to the fact that if you exterminate and enslave same culture cities, this can lead to lots of negative traits, guys. So just bear that in mind when you're conquering. If you are the Antigonids and you are enslaving and exterminating and uh, Macedonian cities, that is not going to be good for you. That's going to be pretty bad. So just remember that that will be something that you have to keep an eye on when you are capturing new regions. And on to some smaller changes now, guys. Forts are now 3,000. So that is really going to stop you from trying to fort wall everything if you are a fort wall type of player. So do bear that in mind. It's not going to be as easy to just build fort walls everywhere anymore if you are that type of player. Me personally, I don't do that very often. So uh, not a huge impact for me. And now watchtowers are a thousand as well. City arrow towers have also been slightly nerfed, so that is going to reduce, of course, exploitative siege campaign gameplay, which I am very guilty of, so I can't even say anything about it. <laughs> and the last couple of points, guys, the public order of the Seleucids and Ptolemies has been rebalanced, so they should be a lot easier to hold on to earlier game, so you aren't losing all of your settlements as long as you govern them properly, nicely, early game and on top of that guys remember huge amount of bug, bug fixes and ctd fixes going into the game all of those ctds that were caused by emergent factions exploding and having a hundred full stacks they have all been fixed so there should be a lot less ctds when it comes to this patch so overall, I think there's going to be a fantastic step forward in terms of gameplay for this patch in terms of the homelands, the emergent factions, the homeland revolts, the public order changes, the changes in balance and the empire system. I think there's going to be so much to look forward to in this patch, guys, in terms of gameplay. Comment down below what you're most looking forward to. But that concludes it for today, guys. So thank you very much for watching. It's been a pleasure. As always, please do like and subscribe. It really does help the channel out. And I will see you all again on the next video. Big thank you once again to David, who is the channel member 
on the channel, guys. Remember, if you do want to support the channel, the channel membership link is in the description and you can get it for as low as $1 or £1 or €1. Euro. So if you really do want to help the channel out, that would be amazing. But thank you very much for watching, guys, and I'll see you all again soon.